Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me, Hank from Eindhoven? I can hear you, Hank. This is Paul. Hi, Hank. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, Hank. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, can hear you. Okay. Hi. Okay, so as Alanis wrote in the chat, we will start in about uh, one minute. He cannot unfortunately hear you, so if you have any questions, just type it into the text, into the chat. So, um, Eva and Nikita, everyone, I, I propose to start the session now, um, the, the training session with the first presentation on smart city policies and governance. Is that okay? Is everyone fine to start? Please um, use the chat to communicate with me since I cannot hear you, unfortunately. Good. Okay, perfect. Very good. So, um, the issue for the first follower training session today um, was chosen because the question that we have to deal with is how do we actually get um, smart solutions and innovation into our cities? And often it's not only a question of technology, but rather a question of the enabling factors. And policies and governance, governance is a very important enabling factor of um, urban development. Um, so. What we deal with usually in our cities, um, or often in our cities, is what I call the NIMBY phenomenon. Um, has everyone heard about the NIMBY phenomenon? It's the not in my backyard phenomenon. So um, we do want wind energy, right? Clean wind energy, but we do not want any wind turbines near our homes. And we do want good air quality in our cities, but we do not. Um, so we, we want good air quality, we want uncongested roads, um, but we still prefer to use our own vehicles and not use the public transportation or not purchase an electric car. Um, so this, this is um, what we are dealing with in cities is this constant balance or often imbalance of public goods, which is goods and yeah, goods that serve everyone, and private goods, uh, which is the individual goods and uh, the, the stuff that makes you happy and feel good as an individual. And they usually do not correspond. So urban policy um, uh, really is to make sure that um, the society can lead... Oh, sorry. The sound is not very clear. For Eva, it's much better. Okay, can you hear me at all? Or is the sound very bad? I can hear you. OK, it is good. Sound is OK. Thank you. So I'll continue. So um, urban policy has to deal with this balance of the society and the individual. What the individual wants usually um, or often is not so beneficial for the society. So balancing this out is, is really the um, key for urban policy. And sustainability regulations, uh, which are necessary to create sustainable and smart cities, they sometimes mean higher prices or lower comfort for some individuals in the city really just individuals, not, the, not, not necessarily the, the city society as a whole. So a good policy, good regulation is <clears throat> when the benefits for the majority outweigh the drawbacks for a minority. 
Um, that is, I think, something that we can agree upon or that is important to have in mind. When designing policies, we, have, we, we, we never, ever create only winners. We always create winners and losers or some who object against the policy. And we, make, we need to make sure that, in, that, that um, individual restraints are minimized and collective benefits are maximized. We also know um, that if no, if no resistance is felt, if something is to change in the city, um, and if no resistance is felt, then usually change isn't happening. So then, then you know, we are not changing anything. So, um, what is what is then a specifically smart policy? Um, we have dealt with this question um, during the. Urbex 3 network smart impact. This is a network of 10 cities, and um, I'm, I'm the lead expert of this network, um, supporting these 10 cities um, to, well, create um, management tools, policies, financing um, tools to create the governance for a smart city. Um, and within this network, we, we have come to a definition of what a smart policy is. And this definition goes as follows. Smart policies are locally adapted regulations and incentives targeted at dealing with innovative technologies and their impact on urban development. So regulations and incentives that deal with innovative technologies. That means we don't have many smart policies because innovative technologies are new. And regulations take time. So technologies and innovations her definition are always ahead of the policy. Smart policies put innovations in use for growing the economy in a sustainable way, for supporting a reduction of the urban environmental footprint, and that increasing the efficiency of public spending. So these are smart policies, and this is we can take indicators out of this definition to measure our smart policies. And also, Smart policies are able to provoke a large impact through a relatively small amount of change. Um, I always love the example of Stockholm. Um, I keep telling it. So the city of Stockholm um, wanted to exchange the, um, the fleet of taxi vehicles to become electric vehicles. And the only thing that the city did was it issued a regulation saying that the first, uh, that, that the, the electric vehicles get to be first in line at the airport. Electric taxis get to be first in line at the airport. So this is a, a very simple regulation, but it managed to change the taxi fleet of Stockholm um, to become 80% electric taxis within six months. And in that regulation, you have all this, right? So it was totally locally adapted. It was about Stockholm taxi, taxi drivers and the Stockholm airport. It was targeting innovative technologies, the electric vehicles. And it put the innovation, uh, innovations in use for growing the economy in a sustainable way. So it was about you know, um, getting taxi drivers to buy different vehicles, um, reducing the environmental footprint, and increasing the efficiency of public spending because for this policy, no cent has to be spent. You only have to sign it. Which brings me um, to the key, actually, of smart policies, or policies in general. Um, it is, you know, cities have a very, very good lever um, on, uh, on change in the city, because cities can actually define the rules of the game. Not in every sector, not on every level, but cities can set local policies and local regulations and local incentives and by this change the behavior. So, so this is something that is very unique to cities or to policymakers. Um, companies cannot do that, citizens cannot do that, other types of institutions cannot do it, and smart, smart policies or policies in general don't, do not cost anything. So, by defining the rules of the game, a city can um, shift investments into the right direction without investing own money. 
So I really encourage you um, to think about policies, regulations, and incentives that would shift the investment into the into a desired direction, because it is a very efficient way of becoming a smart city. Obviously, you have to take into consideration that um, you maximize benefits for the majority. So there is this. Um, there is this. It's a very famous study on um, systems, and you know a city can be seen as a system. And there's a generic study by Donella Meadows that shows the levers or the, the the factors that help change a system, and you can see these 12 levers here. I encourage you to read this very, very short article, like a couple of pages, um, because it helps you see generic um, uh, levers to, ch to induce change in a system. Smart policies define work on the, on the system rules, they work on the system structure, and they work, they work on the system goals. So with policies, you can define uh, the goals, the structures, the organization, and the rules of the system in the city, which are three very, very strong levers. So we really have to work with policies in order to change our city, to become a smart city. Now, um, when developing um, smart policies, we have to keep in mind, sorry, we have to keep in mind um, that we are dealing with behavior, right? So it's, um, it's the behavior of people that we want to change. And the behavior ultimately um, channels, for example, investment and also um, creates emissions or reduces emissions uh, and so on. Um, and behind our behavior, there are two very basic principles. The one is um, we want to go away from, pa from pain as human beings. And we want to go towards pleasure. Um, and this is basically uh, what, what lies behind each good policy, is that we try to push someone away from pain with a regulation. Right? We, we have to induce a little bit of pain, because we know this person will go away from the pain. And we have to create some pleasure somewhere, an incentive, to pull someone into the right direction. So these two principles of the carrot and the stick um, are key principles that act, that lie behind each good policy. Right? We induce a little pain somewhere, make it make some behavior more expensive or more, um, or let's say less easy, and we in, induce pleasure some on another place where we want people to go. We create an incentive to spend money on a specific thing because by making it cheaper, or we make some um, some behavior more likely or more easy, um, we reduce the barriers. So this is, these are the two principles that lie behind smart policies. And always we have to make sure that the benefits for the majority have to outweigh the drawbacks for a minority. So smart policies encompass the right set of pull factors and push factors and that bring citizens or companies to change their practice and investment. Um, and a good example for this is the city of Amsterdam. Um, I hope you can read it. Who has um, induced a very interesting policy mix on the uh, to to become 100% sustainable in the mobility sector until 2040. Um, so Amsterdam, um, you know, on the pull factor, on the incentive, <laughs> it has created a large amount of charging stations with 100% renewable energy for free. So everyone can use it, everyone can charge his or her electric vehicle and at these charging, uh, charging stations. Um, it's very easy to use, you get all the info via internet. There are 40 additional quick charging stations that everyone can use. Um, the, uh, the city um, subsidizes companies uh, that buy electric vehicles for up until 50% of the additional cost for electric vehicles are carried by the city. Uh, then electric vehicles don't have to pay tax or any street tolls. 
there is an electric car to go, which is like a car sharing scheme in the city, and e electric vehicles are allowed to park for free. So these are all the pull factors, right? That one that 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 pull people into the right direction. But at the same time, the city is has also um, created some push factors. So it has um, reduced the tempo, like it has in introduced the tempo limit limit of 30 kilometers out on almost all inner city streets. Um, it has strengthened the rights for cyclists in urban traffic. It has reduced a lot of conventional parking lots in the city, so you will not find that many parking lots in Amsterdam. The parking fees are very high, with like five euros per hour. Um, and there's an environmental zone, so with old cars and diesel cars without filter, you, you cannot go into the city anymore. And for car owners, there is a road tax that they have to pay depending on the size and the emissions of the car. So these push factors, they push you away from using a conventional car in the city of Amsterdam. Um, so I hope you see what I mean. It's about creating the right set of pull factors and push factors to push behavior in a desired direction. And often, um, I mean, you're dealing with different type of people and companies and behaviors and investments, and these, you know, they respond, they correspond to different incentives and regulations. Some of them are more the carrot type, they only move when there's a strong carrot, and others are more the stick type, that uh, really move when there is a good stick. So a good smart policy will always encompass more than one regulation and more than one incentive. That, well, then there is another principle uh, behind the carrot and stick principle, and that is the principle of multi-level governance. Um, and um, all of you know that urban policies are embedded in a larger political frame of like, national or supranational institutions like the European Union. Um, and many issues that have a significant local impact, they aren't decided about on a local level. They are decided at national or at the EU level at the EU level. So this table shows you the um, this table shows you a, an assessment which we have done of um, the sectors where a city has actually decision making authority. Um, and these are the ten cities from the um, project Smart Impact. Um, and everywhere where it is green, it is the city that is the decision making authority and that can you know, create incentives and regulations um, on these on this uh, sector sector. So you can see that specifically in the area of energy regulation, and partially in the area of uh, data, buildings, and sometimes in very few cases public transportation, um, the authority of decision making lies with the national authorities specifically in the energy sector. So there, we really have to rely on, um, uh, on the national or the supranational institutions. But all the other areas, um, there is a lot of leeway of creating with them incentives and regulations and shaping behavior and investment on the local level. Um, so this is uh, actually a, a, pretty, a pretty good um, message that there is true leeway for action in cities to create own smart policies. Um, and this also links <laughs> to, um, a, to a second point. Oh, well, I'll come to that in a second. Um, there is one, well, there is one charter for multi-level governance in Europe. And that charter um, is dealing with the question of how we can bring back decision-making authority to the local level um, and how we can make, you know, create a better exchange and flow of information between the national, the supranational and the local level. So there is this charter um, that can be adopted, that can be um, used by you as cities um, and um, it, it is an instrument at the moment on the European level that is um, trying to get um, a, a more coherent way of creating local policies and integrating local policies into a larger frame. Um, so this may be just just to um, 
So you have this in mind. Then moving on. Um, yeah, so this is this is um, an example of showing how it, how you can create a good regulation and incentive, a good policy on the local level, although you do not have the authority to do it. So um, the message is cities always also need to be creative with regard to smart policy. So in this example that you see here, the city of Freiburg has created specific um, parking parking lots for car sharing um, cars in the public realm. The regulation for parking lots and for streets and traffic in Germany is on the national level. So the city wasn't actually allowed to assign um, you know, private parking lots um, to a public area. That wasn't allowed. So what the city did is it took, you know, it wasn't allowed to do any regulations on the tra tra transport and traffic area, but it was allowed to do regulations on the public, uh, on, on the urban planning area. So the city took the um, land use plan of Freiburg and designed, uh, defined some specific very small areas, these parking lots, as private property, um, and then assigned it uh, to a um, to a manage managing authority, who would then be able to just um, rent it out or provide it to car sharing um, uh, companies. So by using these uh, tricks and leeways, um, cities can also play with the principle of multilateral governance and get regulations across in areas which are actually not just under their authority. So the message for this is, yes, we often think, oh man, I, I can actually not do anything on the local level, but if we look closer, there's more room for action in creating smart policy than we think. A third principle for technology open, uh, for as a third principle for smart policies is the technology openness. Um, we all know that markets are the most efficient way of allocating resources to reach specific goals. So this means it is not a very good idea, it's not very wise to set a specific regulation on a single technology because um, technologies can change, there are innovation cycles and policies on specific single technologies are rapidly outdated. It is much better to define the goal and then let the market identify the best way how to get there. So technology openness is a very crucial aspect of a good smart policy. And um, a good example for this is the cap and trade system in Tokyo, which uh, we were able to analyze in the year 2013. Um, so the city of Tokyo, Tokyo Metropolitan Government, said we put a cap on the overall carbon emissions that um, the largest houses in Tokyo can produce. Um, so they said there's a maximum amount of emissions that you can have per year, and it decreases every year, right? And you can sort out what you do. Um, you can trade your emissions between the thousand largest building owners. And it's totally up to you what you do to bring down the emissions. But if you don't do it, you have to pay it a, a fee or a fine. So this really created a very a boost on innovative solutions in Tokyo. So uh, for example, someone uh, in one district said, well, um, wood is captured carbon. So if we build our houses with wood, can we then sell carbon emission certificates? And the city uh, went back and said, hmm, let's, let's see. Yes, you can actually do that. So by, by building houses with wood, they were able to um, give out emission certificates. And by this, you know, lots of wooden houses started, even skyscrapers started to um, rise in Tokyo. Um, and so, so uh, the, the development of the city was pushed into a very sustainable place. Um, right. So this is one example of a, a wooden skyscraper in Tokyo. 
at the end, um, I don't want to uh, stress you, uh, stress your uh, I don't want to stress you uh, your your patience too much. So at the end, we have designed a cookbook for a smart policy. Um, these are ten, let's say, success factors and ways to do it um, to see uh, to to come to a smart policy. First of all, it's very important to understand that it's about this behavior change. And we want to change the way how people behave, invest, or spend their money in a city. So it's about behavior change. Um, the art of smart policies involves to make the behavior change easy and attractive. Um, it is very important that users and citizens are engaged at an early stage in designing the policy already, because otherwise it is likely to fail. It is very important that the senior level buys in, so that the mayor supports them, that he knows about them, that he likes them. So you have to make sure from the very beginning that the mayor or high decision makers in your city support an idea of a new policy. Examples and pilot projects um, are very good tools to test the impact of a new policy on a small scale. So try to create pilots and test beds, not only with regards to technologies, but also with regards to regulation. So have a specific area where you test a new regulation and see whether um, this experiment proves positive. Um, we've seen that each smart policy needs an individual balance of carrot and stick. Um, data sharing, gamification, and standards are very important factors uh, to design successful smart policies um, because data is the backbone of, uh, of a smart policy. You need to prove the impact of your policy and you can only do this if you have evidence and you will only have evidence if you have data. Um, create problem-driven policies, not instrument-driven policies. So first is the problem then is the policy, it's not you have a tool, let's now look what we can do with it. Um, a good way to start a smart policy is to understand some hidden benefits. Um, for example, this, this example here was about using waste heat from data centers. So where is, um, where is, where is where are some resources wasted in the city that could be used in a more efficient way? This is a very good point where you could start a um, smart policy in your city where you could think of a, a, a good regulation or incentive. And very important, you know that be better than I do actually, timing is everything. So if you have a very good idea for a smart policy, but you are too early or you're too late because of the political cycle, then, um, then it will fail. So make sure that you know and see a window of opportunity to push your policy through in order to be successful. So I think I've now really come to um, the end and to the conclusion. Um, I hope that was a, a somehow um, good introduction into the uh, subject of smart policies. And let's now continue with the other um, examples and the other uh, presentations from the successes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alanos. Uh, now I will uh, hand over to Haley for the next presentation. I will give you now the moderation rights. So there's a question from uh, Sabadell on are you engaging the citizens in the definition stage in process of smart policy? So the first, um, if you want me to answer on that very quickly, the first thing would be to generate a sound idea and to get the, get the backing of the mayor or a, sort of the, the policy leaders, um, at least sort of um, their agreement uh, that you can go forward and then go and discuss it with your citizens before you create, a, you know, already some type of sound regulation and incentive.
Okay, if there are no further questions, I am, I'm happy to take other questions later on. I think, um, Eva, we have, to, we have to move on for um, time reasons. Um, I will um, stop sharing my screen. I think I've done so already. So um, let's, let's move on to the next presentation. Hello, it's Martin from Manchester, and I'm also with Haley, who's part of the Triangulum project as well. And I think we've um, got a little bit of duplication here. Um, our presentation um, duplicates quite a bit of what Alana says. I think we have the impression that you were talking about Morgenstadt and Alana's, but never mind. Um, so, as Alana says, this a lot of this work comes from has been part of the um, Smart Impact Network. So, the people who don't know it, this is the actual network. Um, and there are 10 partners, including Manchester. Um, and as Alana said before, the focus of the project is very much more about governance and about policy, about how smart policies can work in a city. Um, we're not so much concerned about the actual technology. Um, and I think what we can do is um, add to what Alana said by giving some examples, um, some more examples, and maybe some more in-depth examples from Manchester. Um, so there have been five areas um, of which we've been focusing our work. Um, and the one that we're talking about specifically today is the smart financing and procurement. Um, we've also had a meeting about um, a thematic meeting about organizational development. And we're yet to have um, the other one on local innovation systems, data, um, and we've also had one on, um, sorry, supportive regulations and incentives, which is where this comes from. The Smart Impact and Financing and Procurement meeting is going to be taking place in a couple of weeks um, in Zagreb, and we're working towards that. So just focusing again on smart policies. Um, these were the questions that we asked ourselves when we um, had the original meeting. And it was really about looking for examples and tactics and the challenges that, we, that were there to implement. So I'm going to skip through some of these slides so we're not kind of getting into too much duplication. But I think what we bring to it, um, and Alana just gives it a very good um, kind of background to smart policies. But as people who work in the cities, um, this is the kind of thing that we deal with every day, and, um, and, and we're very practically based in it. And what we see as smart policies is that it doesn't have to be part of something legal. It can just be an action within your city. Um, it, 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 and it's about using innovation to grow the economy and how we use and, and adapt regulations and incentives that might be happening already and, and, and it embedded within our city. So how can we use those to uh, direct us in the best way possible? I think the next slide is a bit of duplication. Um, and it, it, it comes from the kind of cookbook idea of what is it you need to create a um, smart policy. But I don't want to go through all of the but a really good one, an um, example of the exciting thing happening for the city urban-wise has been a, a change to our Oxford Road corridor. Um, so this is the busiest road um, buses in Europe. I find that hard to believe when people say it, but that supposedly is the, the statistic. And if you go down that road or you went down that road 12 months ago, what you would have seen is um, a snake of buses. It would have just been bus and bus and bus and bus, all joined up together. So the city has taken a radical approach um, to look at that very differently and to borrow from our Netherlands friends the idea of Dutch cycleways. So you can see on this picture um, that we're actually putting in some proper cycle lanes and that there is going to be a um, closure of that road to traffic at certain times of the day. And one of the questions to Alanis was about engagement. So the process of this happening has taken 
a number of years. It's not happened very quickly, and and some of that is because we've had to put in legal regulations to change the roads. We've had to do a lot of consultation with um, cycle groups, with all the different stakeholders that are on that um, corridor. So it's it's a major location for the universities, for the hospitals, and um, for a lot of um, smaller companies, smaller tech companies. There's a lot of shops and um, particularly kind of food outlets. So the combined authority that is responsible for transport in Manchester has undertaken extensive um, citizen engagement on a, on a very wide scale to come up with this master plan. And I think, as Alana says, um, it won't please everybody. There will always be some people that are not happy about it. Um, but if you any experience of that route, that artery into the city, it was clear that some radical changes need to be done. So the traffic has been diverted onto two parallel roads, which it could be argued will ex experience their own problems as a result of that. But the hope is also that because movement down that road is better and more efficient, that people will then opt towards um, public transport and opt towards um, potentially cycling um, and walking that route. And because the road is closed um, between the hours of is it 9 o'clock and 6, um, that um, there is no choice to be made. That, that is the, that is the the rules um, and it will be um, monitored through electronic number plate recognition and there will be financial penalties for people breaking it and there aren't there is a white list which you can apply to be on so if you're um, an ambulance or you've got essential business you've got to empty the waste bins you know obviously you'll be allowed down during those hours but the majority of traffic will only be um, at night time. So all of these people in this corridor have had to think about how do they get their deliveries. Um, so, um, so is it from another access or is it after hours? And then they too have had to talk to their suppliers. So you can imagine it's been a very big um, exercise and quite a radical change for the city. Yeah. Um, you know, I've lived in the city for, for you know, maybe 30 years, um, and, and over the years, the pressure on that route has grown and grown, um, and hopefully this will create a very different environment. And once you've, ex and once this is up and running, the building work is actually going on at the moment. I think the hope would be that the experience is so positive that um, the city can feel confident to actually introduce similar schemes in other places, um, because ultimately. We've got a city that is growing, and we've got growing pressures, um, and then how do we deal with those? So that is our Oxford Road corridor, um, and one of the key things is that we need to make the options um, easy and attractive for people. So the, one of the ideas of this is to make travel attractive, but obviously you're going to upset some people by doing it, namely car drivers. Okay. Um, and this was about engaging users and about what's in it for me. And I think that example illustrates that you've got to provide um, opportunities for people to feel um, that they can um, get something out of the scheme. Um, and hopefully that will be that will prove to be the case. Um, and another good example from the city, and this is something that's um, very um, close to the work that I'm doing and that other colleagues in my team are doing is um, the city centre review. So this is a um, opportunity that we've um, seized upon. So it's almost um, the Oxford Road example gives you a view of um, a kind of big regulation, whereas this has just um, been a, a, an opportunity that we've managed to seize upon and, and turn towards. Um, and work with other people to create a technology element to it. So this came out of the fact that 
um, the city centre of Manchester is under a lot of pressure. There's a lot of visitors to the city, huge amount of people coming to work every day. Um, there's a lot of tourism, there's um, a lot of people rough sleeping, so there are numerous challenges with, within the city and the city centre services are under a huge amount of pressure. Um, so um, from a high level, from a, from a senior management kind of mayoral level, there were um, people in our um, another department were asked to undertake a review of um, the city centre and to identify what were the issues and to come up with some solutions to some of those issues. So 10 points um, have been um, identified around rough sleeping, about around waste and litter, um, around um, kind of pressure for um, um, nighttime services and the behaviour of people, particularly English people when they've had a few drinks. Um, so all of the kind of problems have been listed and identified and what we we're now doing is using another project and some funding within that project to identify um, a challenge approach where we can borrow from um, some of our colleagues in, and learn from them in Dublin and um, to create a, um, a way of um, asking the market, here are the, some of the problems, have you got some technology that could help us um, solve that? So we're just in the process of um, creating a procurement um, mechanism where we can go to the market and say, these are our problems, how can you solve them with some technology? So it's, it's kind of less of a regulation and, and a policy, but more of an action, but we've kind of seized on that to take it on, uh, take it forward uh, as a smart, some smart initiatives. Um, so, um, and this then, because CityBurb is about um, IoT and about the Internet of Things and about creating it as a demonstrator, that's where we've been um, able to take the opportunity to do um, a test new ways of doing things. Because one of the things in the cookbook that you will have seen from Alanis is that you need to kind of showcase and you need to show that you can success. So we're hoping that these solutions that the people come back with to solve some of our city issues will then be um, so great that the city will want to invest in them. They will see the benefit, probably see a reduction in litter. So some financial benefit is really key, um, particularly in, in a situation where we're being motivated to save money. Um, so that we can provide them as a as a um, and as a way of moving forward. Um, this was the same example that Alana's talked about by taxes, so I'm going to skip that one. Um, and um, data and standards that was also on the list. And um, so one of the things that we'll be looking to do from our city verb work and also from the Oxford Road is um, collect data in order that we can create an evidence base because key to any of these kind of policy making um, opportunities is evidence base and evidence based policy making and cost benefit analysis. All of the cities in Europe are under a, a kind of increasing need to um, show savings. LED lighting is a really good example. We've been able to fund that in the city because it's totally clear to our city treasurer that if you change to LED lighting, it's a lot cheaper. So you can show a, a return on your investment and that makes the path to getting funding for it and um, political will much more um, smooth. And, and I think the last slide is about timing is everything. Um, and this, this example comes from Dublin. Um, Interestingly, Manchester's about to have a new chief executive as well, so uh, we never know what may, the future may hold for us. But certainly in 2013, um, colleagues in Dublin had a new chief executive, um, a chap called Owen Keegan. So when he came in, he kind of 
was obviously somebody who saw small opportunities as as a route forward for the city of Dublin. And it's a very successful but a very busy city. It has a huge amount of tourists, got a lot of demand on, on services and resources there. So in his first year of appointment, he um, created a ded dedicated resource to work at a very senior level to develop smart collaborations and smart initiatives. Um, and I think the key to that is the senior level. So um, Jamie, who works in Dublin, um, he is um, he's on a par with the chief executive and he's got the ear of other senior members. So it's being driven from top down. It's very hard to do um, smart policies and smart changes when you're just the kind of little guys at the, at the bottom shouting about it. And the Dublin approach, um, you know, we've, as we've learned from them, has been um, very positive and it's allowing them to cut across the different silos within that city because as anybody who works in a city will know, lots of different departments, lots of different demands and it's very hard in a time-consumed role to um, for everybody to kind of get together and speak and realise the benefit of this kind of work and I think Dublin have been a, a really good example and a, a really positive contributor to small impact to develop that um, and to, to inform those of us. Okay, and the last slide is about challenges and lessons learned. Um, the full thematic report that both Alanis and I referred to is available online on the Smart Cities EU website. Um, so, and I think just to summarise, there aren't any instant solutions. It's it, what works for one city won't work for another, but you know you can take things and you can take learning and hopefully embed them in your city. Um, we have used grants to fund a lot of our smart city initiatives within Manchester, but um, as a colleague would always say, the city does have a big budget, it's just how we choose to spend it, and that is, um, if, you, if we can demonstrate cost-benefit analysis, then there is much more of a positive um, opportunity for smart policies and regulations to come forward and for us to kind of develop initiatives. And that's just about everything from, from myself. I don't know if haley has got anything to add about um, um, some of the work that we've been doing around health and social uh, care. Yeah, I think just to add to what um, Martine was saying around showcasing and getting uh, buy-in, um, yeah. we're using the opportunity um, through City Verb to influence um, the health and social care agenda in Manchester. At the moment we're going through a process where um, the budget for health and social care is being devolved by central government to the Greater Manchester area and along with that comes a lot of budget pressures and a gap in the budget um, of around £134 million that needs to be met by the local authorities. And so they are looking at new ways of working within health and social care. Um, and her, the City Bird project is using one, a few of its use cases to demonstrate new technologies and new ways of working within that area. Um, so we have buy-in at the highest level um, because the budget gap needs to be filled and we've got support through the City Bird project to find new ways of working that will demonstrate new technology, hopefully demonstrate cost savings and then lead to the adoption and replication of some of the technology that we're demonstrating within the project. Um, and that's one of the ways that uh, Manchester is hopefully going to use some of the technology that's being developed and embed it into the ways of working in the future. Um, I think that's everything for Manchester. Um, just go back here. Hopefully okay. that was okay. Thank you yeah, very much, well, Haley and Martin. I will now hand over to Hank.
Is it my turn? Yes, it's your turn, Hank. You can start. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I will talk about uh, the following. How cooperation made the Eindhoven Brain Port region the smartest region in the world. Now, one thing to make very clear to you all is that that does not happen overnight. That takes maybe, as I will show you, more than 15 years. But it's a sort of consistency, and I will show you later on, that is in our approach and that led to being chosen the smartest region of the world in 2011. And since then, six years have passed, and I will also show you how we build on that um, that success from there in trying to make our city even smarter as it was at the moment when it was chosen. So I tap into a presentation which I made uh, together with a colleague of mine who's not present and that we gave uh, for the city of Copenhagen but which we can use to make sure that you understand what I just introduced to you. Um, my agenda of presentation will be that I will talk about why, how and what. And share the why with your team is one of the most important things in everything that we try to use as a methodology in the cooperation from the municipality of Eindhoven with stakeholders in the region. From the perspective of Brainport Eindhoven, um, we talk about Eindhoven Smart Society which we call, we call the why. Um, so why become a smart society? I would show you a little bit about the driving politicians in the executive committee because as I uh, heard the previous speaker say, senior politician involvement and standing behind a direction in which the city has to move is essential. I will also talk about a little bit about the global economic trend uh, for which we will dive into Eindhoven's history until now. And then I will talk about the how, so some of the ingredients, how to get to a smart society will pass and um, then we'll talk about what we're currently very busy with and that's what next what's next. Smart Society Eindhoven. Okay. From the coalition agreement of the CT executives which was uh, agreed upon uh, in 2014, we can read that a city that uses the combined power of technology, ICT, open data, and fast connections, and design thinking for the benefits of its citizens, a city that actively involves or offers test labs for business and knowledge institutions, and that all with the aim of enhancing welfare, jobs, and sustainability. Application fields are energy, traffic, public space and smarter and better organization of care, education and culture. That was decided upon in 2014 and agreed, agreed between the executives that are in the current coalition of the city of Eindhoven. And when we talk about uh, smart society, um, it's about uh, some of the people that you see their faces. Um, it's about several wise mayors who drive forward from a high political level this smart society. 
it suffice maybe for housing. On the left, and there is one lady with a red skirt. She is uh, the vice mayor mayor of mobility. And there is the Lord Mayor who has left us uh, in September, uh, but uh, he is very famous. He used to be very famous for Eindhoven because he was a strong supporter from the idea of if mayors would rule the world. And there's a Vice Mayor for Labour, Economics and Vocational Education. And on the very far right, the Vice Mayor of Innovation, Design, Sustainability and Culture. These people, although from different parties, drive forward our smart society policies. Something about the global economic trend that Eindhoven went through from long ago when, from the beginning of the 1900s when Eindhoven started to grow. And that would, the reason for that was the low wages that were paid here and the need for jobs and then Eindhoven can be characterized as a company town. In time we moved to a city of pioneers, a city of progress, a city of resilience and we're trying to get as close as possible to a smart society at the moment. And in red, you see the main elements that characterize these periods in time. I will zoom in to the different ones. We started out as a company town. This is a building where Philips uh, Electronics was situated. And this shows around 5 o'clock when all the workers left the premises of the industry of Philips. You see a large wall around that building that is not there anymore. And you see everybody going home. So that was around 5 o'clock in the evening. And it really was a company town. Um, you, only, you did not only work for Philips, you, if you played uh, football, he probably played it in one of the teams that was supported by the Philips company. The fire engines were supplied by the large industry of Philips for the municipality. There was a cultural uh, institution that was paid for by Philips to enrich the workers not only with a monthly income but also with some uh, places to um, get to know all kinds of music, music home, and to bring them some pleasure after work. So the company was really the driving force that was shaping the city. From that industry and, and making light bulbs where it, start, where it all started. Um, there was also a lot of research being done in Eindhoven. And the city became famous as a city of pioneers, engineers trying to find new ways, new technologies. That was around the 20s until the 50s and the 60s. And in the 60s, it became a city of progress. In the 60s, in which Philips showed all their researched uh, elements that would uh, conquer the future, but were not there yet. 
And as a child, as a 12 year old. Uh, Hank, I'm sorry to interrupt you uh, because we have lost the sound for one minute. Can you please repeat what you said to slide nine? Yeah. Thank you. In the 60s, in the, 60s uh, the city really took off. And it was a time that the economy really boosted in the Netherlands and in Eindhoven even more. It became a city of progress, which uh, a lot of people uh, made it, or came to the city and started to work. Um, one of the landmarks still there in the city is this flying saucer-like building that used to be a museum in which Philips showed all the new uh, technologies that they were at that moment researching. So it gave you a little bit of a future insight. And as a child of 12 year old going to the basic school, the primary school, I remember that one of the the big events was when you went with your class to this museum and you spend the whole day running around and looking at all the different techniques, trying them out. Many, many school children in the Netherlands visited for that reason the flying saucer and made contact with the Philips company. But it didn't stay that good. In the 90s, as you can see, um, because there is a time scale on the horizontal axis, from the 80s into the 90s, there was a crisis. And the Philips industry uh, took off and uh, left for an important part the city of Eindhoven. All the industry was moved to uh, other parts of the world where the markets were. What stayed was a lot of research and development. But in the 90s, in the 1994, it was so bad that in one year uh, Philips uh, had to lay off 30,000 people and on top of that the car manufacturer that we also had in the town laid off 10,000 people and went bankrupt. And that was the moment when we started with the Triple Helix Stakeholder Cooperation. The mayor of Eindhoven, the uh, executive director of the Technical University, and some of the leaders from the uh, large OEMs, of which Philips was one, um, st were sticking their heads together and saying, oh, how can we uh, do something about this crisis? And they uh, really tried to help the economy of the city. And from there, we went upwards again, as you can see. You can see the Design Academy came to Eindhoven, which is still there, which is quite famous, one of the fifth ranking design schools in the world. Eindhoven Airport started to grow. The Dutch Design Week was um, started. ASML, a firm, a large OEM that produces enormous machines that uh, create all the tiny little circuits that we find in our phones and in the computers, is working from the Brainport area of Eindhoven. And in 2012 we became, we were chosen as the smartest Slimste Regio, it's on the far right, in Dutch, of the world. In the meantime, the, um, the region where uh, Philips used to have its industrial quarters and industry, Stripe S, was being abandoned slowly. And Stripe S is currently one of the um, lighthouse areas in Triangulum where we find all the new technologies that characterize smart society, smart city, I know. So we became a city of resilience through 
uh, going uh, through a crisis, we became that city. And also we started to realize that next to the airport uh, in Schiphol, Amsterdam, and to the seaport in Rotterdam, we spoke of a brain port in Eindhoven because there was so much research and development in on the, let's say, the square kilometer. It's the most dense, uh, the most dense uh, place in the Netherlands where you find work in that kind of uh, of the of the economy, research and development. So then moving on to how to become a smart society and how to become the most clever um, region of the world. There are several ingredients that I would like to mention to you. And this is a picture that I'm not going to explain exactly, but here you find many of the elements uh, that are combined and we are trying to uh, give uh, attention to to organize that in a better way. But from top to bottom you see that communities are a very important part of that. Share and learn. Instruments where we work and co-create together of which roadmaps that picture a vision in the future and living labs uh, are essential elements and also more and more we're talking about the fundamentals which need to be aligned and then I'm talking about architecture, security and standards when it comes to data. Another element that is essential is that we have some important policy documents that guide and mark our position in Brainport Eindhoven. On the left, on the top left, you see that we are a member and chosen by the Intelligent Community Forum, a smartest region in the world in 2012. Our previous mayor also was in the executive committee after we were chosen. There is a vision and a roadmap on urban lighting beneath that. In the middle you see Expedition Eindhoven. This is the coalition agreement that we are still working with until we will have next elections March 2018. We have also on the top right a mobility uh, uh, plan which is guiding us we signed the Covenant of Mayors. We have uh, a green digital charter. And at the bottom, you see that we are implementing a program for smart society, and that is in full progress, meaning that that is not a completed document. And it will never be completed, because it will be updated all the time. And the reason for that is that technology is changing so fast at the moment that uh, it's hard for a city, uh, even like Eindhoven, to cope with that and to stay with it in organizing their different departments. Other agreements, and I'd like to point out, can be small innovative activities. space better, Buiten Baker in Dutch. It is a very nice tool to use and it is fully operational 
at the moment. I'm sorry to interrupt like you again, Hank, um, but again we had a problem with the sound. Can you please repeat slide 15? Yep. Thank you. Small inactive actions, uh, activities are also an essential element. One of the elements I'd like to point out is that in 2010, Eindhoven supported a small SME from the region to as a first-time customer and this app that works on phones, mobile phones, you can report uh, things which are uh, a problem or are wrong in public space. The app is called Buitenbeter in Dutch which means public improvement quality in English. What it does is you take a picture of something that you would like to report. In this case, it's waste besides the bin. And um, it automatically um, gives a GPS uh, location, but you can also describe uh, and give a little explanation of why you took the picture, where it is, and then you just send it to an address um, and you type in your name. What happens then, it comes automatically into the city and it is guided at this moment straight to one of the local contractors who should take care of this problem. Um, when you try it out, you can see that within a day or within two days, the problem is being solved. And because you reported it, um, you actually can see it yourself if that waste would be removed, but you also are thanked by the city automatically when the job is taken care of and uh, they thank you for being um, helping to make the public space uh, better and, uh, and create a better quality. This is a small innovative activity but it is using the new technologies and it is really involving citizens to work with the city to improve their living circumstances. Other ingredients that you should take care of when you move forward in a consistent strategy is that events are being used to brand the city. Um, we are a member of a lighting network and we have a glow festival uh, which we tried out in 2006 <coughs> with an international ambition. Uh, it's in a, a mixture of art design using the existing architecture. It's in public space, everybody has free access and it enhances the pride of the Eindhoven citizen and the citizen from the region. Um, it has grown to 2016 when we had more, had more than 600,000 visitors. And you can walk around and fill the city for more than a week, or for a week, and you will be able to experience all kinds of new elements in which light plays an important role. Other events that brand the city of technology and R&D are the Dutch Design Week, which is the third week of October, which started in 2002 with 20 participants uh, and has now um, grown to more than 300 events that attract 300,000 visitors a year. It shows design in all aspects, so not only interior design, but also design in the combination with lighting, with help, with uh, design thinking, uh, steering, citizen participation, uh, communicating with stakeholders and more of these kind. We also have a Dutch Technology Week which is much smaller but is growing every year. Um, it, is there, been, it has been there since five years. We have, for example, a Beyond Data Congress, which will take place in two weeks, um, where 
we contribute to the discussions around data, open data, and how big data could be used in a smart society for the benefit of citizens and the benefit of the municipality itself. Another very important element is that we, from a very early beginning, so 15 years ago, we already started with small living labs um, where we, uh, in uh, joint uh, cooperation with businesses as uh, stakeholders from an area, municipality, and more and more with the end users, citizens, or um, small businesses, for example, when you talk about the inner city, work together. Um, we have uh, a roadmap, roadmap on smart lighting, which we developed in cooperation between Philips and Heimans, both companies. Uh, we have a Bar Street, Stratum's Eind, in cooperation with the Dutch Institute of Technology and Security. Uh, Hank, I'm and sorry. Uh, can you please uh, keep the time restriction? I just want to remind you. Yeah. Okay, so maybe okay. in two or three minutes. I will, will finish. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, living labs are at the heart of smart society. And uh, what we try to do at this moment is to beef up these living labs into larger projects like Triangle, which most of you listening in are familiar with. But this shows you the cities that cooperate. Triangle in Eindhoven um, is a success for us when it creates successful business models for smart city solutions, when citizens and local state or stakeholders of the data on the open data platform uh, really uh, experience that spin-off towards services and applications will improve quality of life, that we can successfully replicate elsewhere, so beyond the lighthouses that we have, within the city of Eindhoven, that we really uh, co-create involving citizens and that it contributes to jobs and new cooperatives and services in Brainport Smart Society ecosystem. One of the impacts of wind triangle was that we started and that we could not go around it anymore of a Smart Society implementation program. And what entails this, this is a framework for cross-sector prioritization and how to proceed. Things that we interconnect are data, the connectivity, the infrastructure, and platforms, from living lab to upscale business cases, community and ecosystem development, and communication and branding. And I hope that from my, what I previously, previously mentioned, you can already see that some of the elements were present. So data is really the new element which is uh, very important to us. And to end this, I will skip some of the, uh, the slides that I have. But I will move to one picture. Uh, how do I get there? the organization that we used to have before with the organization that we are currently trying to accomplish.
and which we have after we become a fully smart society. On the right you see different elements that have to be, that were characterized and these uh, uh, elements of becoming a smart city uh, are being uh, directed or um, towards the different um, departments and sectors of the management structure of the city of Eindhoven. And when you would look and take a good, uh, when you would look and take a, uh, how can I move this? When you would compare the situation above and beneath, you see that the number of uh, places where ICT and data in the city of Eindhoven. So uh, the places where a red rectangle uh, is, is uh, let's say, mirrored upon has been growing over the last years. Um, this is the most prominent change that ICT and data uh, used to be only in informatics and management and in another place the, um, the, the realization and management and control departments but if you scroll down you see that these red rectangles are now in many more places uh, an item which is being taken care of. So the number of red rectangles has grown enormously. This means that we employ more and more people within the different management uh, sectors um, that have to do and have to come to an integrated approach to ICT and data. This is one of the biggest changes that we go through. And that, uh, I will stop there since my time is up. Thank you very much, Hank. Uh, Hank, can you maybe uh, zoom into the graphic? Uh, let me see. Yes, I can. Can you see my mouse? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I was saying that I see the data. I now correct all these different sectors. So we haven't changed many of the organizational structure, but we have made ICT and data more prominent in most of the sectors dealing uh, with, for example, citizen contacts, communication, security, and with support. Um, when you compare the situation after and before. Here you find only two places where ICT and data were prominent. This is the biggest change between the situation up and down. This is not being done because you see here a picture of how to become and how to make decisions on where the city is moving more integrated. That's in Dutch, so I won't. Uh, but this is what, is what we are still working on. And I presume that that will not be finished within one year. Because as I, as I always make a comparison, it's like moving a super tanker, or trying to move a super tanker from a uh, northern course to an eastern or western course. And that is uh, taking. Thank you very much, Hank. 
Um, there w there's a question in the chat from Adam, um, if the presentation will be at disposition. I can send it to you. Could you send it to Jeff? Yes. Okay, fine. Thank you. Um, then we can move on to the question and answer part. Um, Haley will be uh, also a moderator. So what we can do now is um, you can either uh, open your microphones and ask questions, or you can just uh, type your questions into the chat if you have no microphone, and then you will get an answer. I have a question to Haley or to Martin. Yes, thank, Hank, we can hear you. Um, I have a question to Martin. Uh, Martin, do you believe that when you change four kilometers of route, where you provide more ideal circumstances for people on foot and bicyclists, it will work if the rest of the city stays the same? Are you saying how will it work if the rest of the city is different? Is that right? Is that the question you're asking? Yeah. I'll type it. Okay, so um, what it's, it's a very good question, it's an up direct question. Um, the rest of the city has changed um, to a degree, but this is probably the most radical change, and, and I think this was about this being a key artery into the city and a key artery for the universities. Um, so um, there are lots of um, employers on that on that space. So um, and there's a lot of students moving around between the university and the city. So I think you're right. The fact that it's only four kilometres is not great. Um, but ultimately, we've also um, we live in a Victorian um, industrial city, um, and it, you know, it's, it's very hard to make those changes uh, physically, let alone with regulations, because we don't have um, we don't have the same kind of flexibility that you've got in Holland in terms of kind of space at all, really. Um, but I think the hope is that some of the work that's done on Oxford Road will then translate, and you kind of have to start somewhere. So the hope is that by making that route, which is so busy, more accessible for the buses, um, electric vehicles, um, bicycles and pedestrians, that people shift the way that they travel into the city centre that use that route and use those methods of transport rather than private cars, etc. Um, and somebody's just how long it's taken to prepare and implement the regulations. Uh, it must be four years, I would say. It must have been in the making for four years. Yeah. It, the transport in Manchester is managed by the devolved um, wider authority, so it's not actually um, something that's within our departments. It's the transport for Greater Manchester. The other driver that has um, created an opportunity is that the government are, they deregulated our bus networks um, so in London they have a Greater Manchester, Greater London transport network. In London, in Manchester, we have um, some of it is um, operated by Transport for Greater Manchester, like the trams. But all the bus networks are just run by individual um, operators, and it's very chaotic. 
there will be some government legislation that allows us to, to make some changes to that. Um, just there's a, a question from Marguerite and David around um, inclusion of smart technology sector and whether there's been any special procedure or um, organisation to involve those companies. So I think from Manchester perspective, everything that we do is through uh, procurement um, or through working on projects together. So we put in bids with te the technology sector and be partners with them um, for any grant applications. And then when we are looking for smart technology partners for solutions in our city, it will be through an open procurement procedure. Um, for example, what we're undertaking on the city centre review and looking for innovative solutions um, to issues, and, and that's being looked at at the minute. So anything else from yours? Um, and there has been, over the years, a big um, effort to develop um, the, the ecosystem of technology and, um, and fintech, you know, financial technologies mm -hmm. within Manchester. There's been a lot of um, investment in that kind of area. Okay. Um, just going back to Hank, his question around a policy to support the stakeholder groups representing cyclists. Um, Sophie can answer that from Manchester. Um, Hank, we have um, in Manchester um, a cycle forum, which is um, the way in which we um, update our cycling stakeholder groups about um, not only um, physical infrastructure improvements that we're planning, but also um, policy developments and sort of general themes of interest to um, cycling stakeholder groups. That cycle forum is open to to anybody, um, but it is mainly the the groups that come. So it usually dedicates half of its meeting to. Um, Sort of items of interest that are happening in the city and half to um, talking about planned infrastructure improvements. So I know um, when Martine mentioned it's been um, you know many years in the making the, the um, closure of Oxford Road, I know there have been many different iterations of the design of the cycle lanes which have gone backwards and forwards with the cycling groups. Um, so they have had a forum there through the City Council Cycle Forum that meets um, once a month to input their thoughts um, into the um, design of the infrastructure um, for the cycle lanes. Well, that's okay, um, Hank. Um, just picking up on um, um, Mark, is it uh, problems around open Wi-Fi? Um, uh, that it's illegal in the EU because of market reasons. Um, Manchester has open public Wi-Fi in the city centre, um, so I'm not sure if there's anything specific in relation to that, but it, maybe it's something... Yeah, I think when you say it's illegal, illegal. the legal advisors say it's illegal, um, I think it's because of state aid rules, yeah. so you can't... Um, the city can't provide it because it. Um, but what we do provide is a concession to use some of our infrastructure mm -hmm. to do that, and then you get. Um, you can have thirty minutes free. What, how well it's used, it, you know. At the end of the day, we're a we're a northern city in a very damp climate. So how much time people spend, and, and you know, four G and five G are starting to kind of erode that. Really, and then with um, you know people get three minutes, those kind of things. Um, yeah, we do. There is public Wi-Fi in Manchester in um, the city centre, is, but it, I don't know about other cities. No, I mean I think other cities do seem to provide it more. I remember being in Tallinn years ago, and they provide it. Manchester, we've not. Um, it, it, you know, there is some free Wi-Fi for a short period, but the thing is, it's also the market. There's lots of cafes, places actually provide it as well. Yeah. Um, there, 
the was a couple, there was a question from Sabadell and then um, I think Adam had a, a summary of the points to take from today. So if we just go through Sabadell's question around convincing senior level officers and politicians to put money into innovation budgets. I know Alanis has um, highlighted some different approaches around demonstrating the value and knowing your audience. I think the approach that Manchester's taken, there isn't an innovation budget as such. What we have tried to do is link what we do as a city to um, our overall strategy of our Manchester and the aims that have political buy-in at that level and link it to the opportunities we've been able to um, secure through grant funded projects such as Triangulum and City Birth in order to work those um, opportunities into the mainstream and into the overall policies for Manchester City Council in order to try and make us a smarter city. I think ultimately it's about cost-benefit analysis. Um, if you can show that something's value for money or it makes services more efficient, you know the senior people would always want to, to hear that. And if, if that can be exploited. Yeah. Um, so procurement rules, yeah, we're, the UK is covered by the European procurement rules and all due. Currently. Currently. <laughs> um, not sure what will happen after Brexit. Um, and then we have our own local rules for values under the public procurement uh, limits as well, which we have to adhere to, and that's at a national level. Um, um, Adam, around um, to everyone, um, summarising what the um, points are to take from today. Um, enlighten leadership or buy-in, um, which I think is a good point. Senior level ownership and understanding of what's trying to be achieved. Look, knowing the local sticks and carrots, so what is going to prompt people to change and what you have available uh, within your cities to encourage change. Um, and then active society and branding of the city, which is the point that Hank was making through the different events and um, things that are held in Eindhoven is a good example of that. And then data, um, yeah, innovative procurement approach. Yeah, I think the very good highlights of what was uh, presented today. I think one of the examples of the innovative procurement is the discussion that, or the point that Martin raised around Dublin and how they approach their procurement um, across their city. Um, so it's asking for solutions to problems rather than defining the answer um, in the procurement process, asking for the proposals and the returns to define how they would address a certain problem. Um, and that's a different way of getting innovative solutions to problems that you may not have envisaged. Is anything? No, I think I think it is a challenge and particularly where procurement's being done in a in a very kind of restrictive way and and uh, you know it's, uh, there is a challenge procurement departments on board a specific procurement department I was meeting with them yesterday to try and explain this and a different approach and this is only for 120,000 euros it's it's really small amount of money so the idea that you would be doing this for something much bigger um, would, would challenge them further, but I think you know it's small steps. Mm. You know, we, it's it's the fact that we're raising it and we're putting it on the agenda. And I think you know there's a lot to be learned in the state so from Dublin. I think I've captured everyone's questions on the chat, but if I haven't, please shout out now. 
Um, and has anyone got anything else they'd like to discuss? Unless someone's writing a really long question. <laughs> uh, oh, here we go. I'm not sure if... Um, sorry, uh, Martin, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, it seems like uh, Moniels want to show us some presentation. Can you see this also? No. Okay, maybe we can, maybe in five minutes, um, make him to presenter to see what he wants to show us. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Haley and Martin, I think there are some questions for you. So, in terms of data and cyber security, um, yeah, privacy of data is a, a very big issue and is something that we're looking at in the City Bird project on how you manage existing data, new data that's generated by a project. Um, and making parts of that data available and open. Um, so we're right at the beginning of that journey. Previously, I think organisations individually um, are responsible to look after their own data and make elements of it available, but through CityVerb we're looking to combine all that information. It's into like it's called a platform of platforms, so bringing together lots of different data streams and having it be accessed by one point, one API, and um, we're undertaking that at the moment and that will hopefully be one of the outputs of the project. But yes, it's very important and um, something that we're taking quite seriously in terms of that that project and Triangulum. And it is a, um, you know, it's a wider question that's, that's quite often reported in the press and um, because every time you start, you open the door with Internet of Things, you know, you you have something, an item that connects to the internet, you have a, um, a door, a vulnerability door, so it's a huge issue. Yeah. 
think Alanis has answered Hank's question around the um, e-cars and being able to sustain the policy against local income. Um, I mean, the, in Manchester, we've mm. had a Greater Manchester electronic electric vehicle charging network mm -hmm. and for a, a good while that's been free so you can charge your vehicle for free but that was about um, you had to get the infrastructure out there and you have to get a critical mass of people using it and then there is a point when you have to introduce charges clearly but you know it, it, it's almost like you, until the infrastructure was there nobody would buy an electric car so it's, it's chicken and egg really to stick in current. <laughs> I think that's it on the questions. Do we want to hand over the presenting? Yes, sure. Now, um, Munoz is going to get the moderator rights. So, yes, you can show us now your screen if you want to. Okay, so we, it seems like we don't get any screen, so um, maybe we can uh, move on with any other questions, Haley and Martin. Um, um, unless there's any other questions from anyone. Um, I'm assuming the presentations from today will be circulated and um, 
attendance list, etc. Um, and people are welcome to contact us for any information or discussions that they want to have separately or in more detail. Is there anything from anyone else? Okay, it doesn't look like there's any other questions from anyone. Um, so, either is that okay to to close the webinar. Thank you very much to everyone. Yeah, thank you for attending. Yeah. Okay, thank then. You. Thank you also to all the presenters. Thank you very much from Savali. Yeah. Okay, thanks to everyone and of course to the presenters too. So uh, I will close now the session and have a nice day. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.